Man, isn't that an encouraging song? And the Holy Spirit lives in us and gives us power to fight the good fight, to live the life that Christ has called us to live. I'm going to lead us in prayer, just like we do every week. I'm, I'm going to kneel down front. You can join me down front and kneel here. You can turn around and kneel right where you are. You may just want to stand and lift your hands up as we continue to worship him in prayer. Or you just may want to sit and be quiet. But let's be still before the Lord and let's pray this morning. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do want to lift your name high. We want to make much of who you are. We want to make much of what you've done. We want to praise you and worship you this morning. But Lord, we also come here knowing that since we gathered a week ago, that hasn't always happened. Our lives haven't reflected the power that you've put in us. Our attitudes haven't been Christ-like. Our thoughts haven't been godly. And so, Lord, I pray for forgiveness where we fall short, where we've sinned. We've sinned against you. We've sinned against our brothers and sisters. We've sinned against others at, at our work and schools and neighbors. And so, Lord, I pray for forgiveness. Lord, I pray this morning that as we open your word, you will do what, what I can't do, what we can't do. That Lord, you'll open our eyes to truth. You'll open our hearts to truth. And Lord, if there's anyone in here and they don't know you as Lord and Savior, I pray this morning that you will Reveal yourself to them, that you'll call them, that you'll adopt them. And Lord, their only response is gratitude. And Lord, I pray this morning, once again, that we leave here changed. That Lord, the the shortcomings, the sin that we had this past week, Lord, we'll see it. We'll recognize it, and we won't fall for it again. That we do claim the power of the Holy Spirit living in us to fight the good fight. And that, Lord, we'll know that there's something wonderful about being with you. Lord, I love you, and it's in Jesus' name that I ask all these things. And God's people said, Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, you want to go ahead and turn to... Oh, I'm sorry. I knew it was going to happen. Children, y'all get on up and go on to Children's Church. It's still not habit yet, so uh, I'm glad Douglas is back there going, don't forget, don't forget. If you have your Bibles, you want to turn to Daniel chapter 2. And I'll just tell you that uh, you get, re- get ready for some more history this morning as we just kind of look at a little bit more detail about some things so that we can figure out what's going on here and how this is all playing out. Um, I think too often we just think these are, are moments in history and we don't see what's leading up to it. But you'll notice that, again, the, the sermon series title is Hope in the Midst of Change. And I think you're going to see again, Daniel has already been shipped off to Babylon and change is about to happen very quickly. He's about to find himself in a situation that, uh, wow, the last situation cost him his, his home, his culture, his family. This situation could cost him his life. So we want to honor God's word as we read it together. So would you please stand with me as we read Daniel chapter 2, just the first uh, 16 verses. I'll, I'll just tell you, we're going to be in Daniel 2 for a couple of weeks at least. Uh, 
probably more than that, but uh, we're going to just hang out. We're not going to get as far as you probably think this morning, but let's read this passage. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I had a dream. And my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The word from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb, and your houses shall be laid in ruins. But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. They answered a second time and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know with certainty that you are trying to gain time, because you see that the word from me is firm. If you do not make the dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the times change. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can show me the interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. For no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of a magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult, and no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Because of this, the king was angry and very furious and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the decree went out, and the wise men were to be killed, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He declared to Arioch, the king's captain, Why is the decree of the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel. And Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. Would you please be seated? This is some difficult stuff here. You've got a king who's had a dream. Now, I don't know about y'all. There are times that I remember my dreams and I wake up the next morning. I'm going, that was weird. I kind of remember my dream from last night, and it was weird. Um, We were on a mission trip, and you're going, great, you're going to tell us. It just was weird. We were on a mission trip, and we were doing a um, vacation Bible school, and where we were, we discovered there was a python there, and we had to get the kids in before the python killed someone. I don't know what to tell you about that. Other than I did see a video the other day of a python killing a deer, and I don't know if that got in my mind. So, but imagine if I stood up here and said, I had a dream last night. So, tell me what my dream was. You couldn't do it. Maybe you had a dream last night. I couldn't tell you. Matter of fact, if you had a dream and you said, I had a dream, I'd go, what was it? I wouldn't go, oh, let me tell you what it was. But the king is asking something of these men. And man, there are, I was telling Andrea, there are about a thousand different directions that you could begin to ask questions in this. But I thought we would just start with the obvious that happens right here at the beginning. Apart from the Lord, there is no ultimate hope. And you may be going, where did you get this? Well, notice at the very beginning, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled. And his sleep left him. You know, we're we're all amazed and in shock when we get up in the morning and some of you will go to your favorite website and see the latest news and some of you, uh, you turn on the news in the morning. Maybe you don't have to get to work so early or maybe you're a stay-home mom or dad and you turn on the news and all of a sudden we'll hear about somebody that everyone knew committed suicide. It happens over and over again. And we're all shocked. 
I, I, I mean, that guy, uh, that guy was so funny. You, you've seen this over and over, comedians killing themselves. You're going, but they were the life of the party. How could they be depressed? Or some singer that you, you held in high regard because you loved his voice or her voice, and the next thing you know, they're, they OD'd on drugs. And you're going, what in the world? But look right here. Here's Nebuchadnezzar. He is well-known, obviously. He's the king. His word is final. Whatever he says, that's what happens as far as man can take it. I mean, he, he doesn't get to say, man, I would like to lobby for something. You see right here, he's about to say, I'm going to kill all the wise men in Babylon. And just because I said it, it's going to happen. He is the pinnacle of the world power at that point in time. He's rich. He's got anything that any person could want at that point in time. His money could buy it. And if he couldn't buy it, he could just say, do it anyway, because I'm the king. And yet, notice that his spirit is troubled, and his sleep is no more. What happened? Why is he so troubled? That should be very telling to you and me, because eventually, even the most powerful, even the most influential, will come face to face with their weakness, and they will discover that they are limited. They're limited. You and I, we think that we have control of things around us. We, we think we have control of our jobs. We think we have control of our companies. We think we have control of our families. We think we have control, by the way, huge mistake. We think we have control of our kids. And all of a sudden, we begin to lose sleep when we realize that we're limited. We're limited in our understanding. By the way, as I get older, This year is 50 years old. I am limited by what I can do physically. I can't do what I used to do when I was 20. I went out with the kids and Douglas and we went water skiing. And man, what I used to do and what I can do now are two completely different things. I mean, we grew up on the lake water skiing all the time. I just can't do it anymore. My body just doesn't react that way. And when when I hit the water, it hurts. We're limited by our abilities. We we are limited people. And you'll notice that the king is ready to turn to anybody to fix this situation. I need some answers. I'll turn to magicians. I'll turn to enchanters, sorcerers, Chaldeans. And by the way, that's really no different than today. People are perplexed by the troubles of this world. They're perplexed by their own limits by their own problems, and they will turn to anything because guess what? They have no peace, and their sleep is leaving them. Why do you think? It it is amazing to me that every time I'm watching TV, there is a new product to help us sleep better. I don't even know how our grandparents ever slept because they didn't have the sleep-by-number bed. They didn't have the Tempur-Pedic bed. They didn't have the bed that air conditions itself or heats itself. They didn't have, uh, they didn't have my pillows that are adjusted just to us. They didn't have any of those things. Not only that, but even if you get past those external products, they have internal products. Hey, you need this medicine to help you sleep better and this medicine to help you sleep better and this medicine to help us sleep better. But that is not the problem. That's just a symptom. You realize that? It's just a symptom. The problem is not the lack of sleep. The problem was his spirit is troubled. You know, we don't, we don't have little children in here, but I would venture to say in this room now, there's not a one of us who would say, I've never had a problem going to sleep. Man, I can remember there were nights when I did not sleep at all. At least it seemed like that. I was worried. I was worried about what was going to happen the next day. I was worried about my future. I was worried about a, a billion different things. But... We think, oh, if we can just remedy these things, if I can get a new mattress, if I can get a new pillow, if I can get some new medicine, then I can remedy this. That's, that's the same thing. Uh, right now, Kaylee is, is, is starting, to, she's got a little bit of a cold going on. 
I can't fix the cold. We, we can take care of some symptoms. We can try to, she had voice tryouts yesterday for a choir and, and she was like, I'm stopped up. And I was like, the best I can do is maybe, maybe we can get something that will clear you up a little bit, but we haven't solved the problem. And you know this, you, you can buy all the Kleenex you want and get all the Sudafed you want and nose drops and sprays and throat, whatever. You get all of that stuff, but really until you get rid of the cold, you still got the problem. Just taking care of some symptoms. And do you know what we do? We tend to turn to everything but the Lord. Everything. I could spend, you could spend, we could spend the rest of our lives reading self-help books in order to try to solve these problems so maybe we could sleep better. I just did a quick Google search First of all, I just put in self-help, and that I, I didn't have time to go through the 26 million hits that came up. But then I did self-help books, and I clicked on one link, and it was the top 50, I think, self-help books. There are self-help books for men, women, relationships, self-esteem, emotions, career, finances, happiness, parenting, searching for meaning, positive thinking, willpower. I love this one, inner creativity. I don't know about that. Procrastination. And, and that, was just, that was just a brief, let me just run through these. I did see a meme the other day. It made me laugh. It said, if there was a pill for procrastination, I'd probably take it tomorrow. <laughs> Think about it. And I'm not anti-self-improvement. But I can tell you, you can do all these things. You can, you can read all these books and say, oh, yeah, tomorrow I'm going to do this because this is about self-improvement. And, and, and then the next day I'm going to do this because there's these steps you've got to go through. And I'm going to do all these steps, and I'm going to do that. But i got news for you. Just like King Nebuchadnezzar, you've got to lay down at night. And all of a sudden, doing all these things, that stops. And it's just you and whether you want him to be or not, just you and the Lord there. The, the real need that you have, you can do all these things to try to quiet your spirit, to try to return sleep, but the real need that you have is you need a Savior. Because i got news for you. All these self-help books, all these, these, all these nose sprays and, and, and Sudafed and all that, won't get rid of a cold, and all these self-help books, they will not make you right with God. That's only Christ. Only a relationship with Christ will bring you real and lasting peace. Here's a man, Nebuchadnezzar, who has everything except one thing, peace. He doesn't have it. And you're about to see the difference in Daniel as we look at this story. And again, we're going to Pull it apart, and next week we'll come back and grab another part that you're going, oh, you skipped that part. No, I'm just taking it piece by piece. But Daniel, who in some ways has nothing, he's lost his home, his family, his culture, his nation, and yet he has peace. I'd venture to say, again, we're not children in here. We're teenagers and adults. I'd venture to say there is not anyone in here who has not been blindsided. If you're a football fan, you've seen it a million times. The quarterback goes back, and if he's right-handed, this is his blindside because he's ready to throw a pass, and he's there, and all of a sudden some guy comes around the end, and he's got free reign, and he goes into the quarterback. And I will tell you, again, the older I get, the more it seems like it hurts when I see that <laughs> because you see his back bend in a way that his back should not bend, and the ball comes out, and there's a, there's a loose ball, and someone will get it, and they will say he's, he was blindsided. And here's the deal. The quarterback, it wasn't his fault. But he's paying the price for the fact that someone didn't block that guy. 
And so he gets blindsided. So how do we begin to look at what is going on, not only with Nebuchadnezzar, but what's going on with Daniel? And I will tell you that part of this is not a blindside, not at all, but part of it is. So let's do some history. We'll do it quickly, I hope. You remember this slide from a couple of three weeks ago, and we started looking at a brief history of what was going on in Scripture. Well, let me get to this one. There we go. So you got the tribes of Israel, and I want to remind you that Jacob, in Genesis 35, he was renamed Israel. So if I say Jacob or I say Israel, Israel is not even a people group yet. Israel is a man at this point in time. Jacob and Israel, same person. Jacob was renamed in Genesis 35. He had 12 sons, and it's too long of a story for this morning for me to tell you about Jacob and Leah and Rachel and their servants. It's messed up. If you don't know the story, it's messed up. But just like us, the fact that God chooses to use Jacob is not based upon Jacob's righteousness. Amen? Just the same way that when God uses us, it's not based upon our righteousness. It's based upon his sovereign choice. So God uses Jacob. But when you look at Jacob, he really, he, he's got two wives and then there's two servants and that's how he has these 12 kids. But he really has two kids that are by his favorite wife. And I know right now you're going, this is already messed up. Yes, it is. But he has a favorite wife and that is Rachel. So Jacob's favorite son is Rachel's and his oldest son. His favorite son is Joseph. And you know that because it was Joseph who got that coat of many colors. Y'all know that story. So he gets this coat. And by the way, we're even told in Scripture that Israel or Jacob loved Joseph more than his other sons because he was the son of his old age. Now, you may go, well, if Joseph is his son in old age, what about Benjamin? Well, if you weren't aware of this, Rachel died in childbirth with Benjamin. So Joseph is his oldest son by Rachel in his old age and is his favorite son. Benjamin doesn't hold quite as uh, high a esteem with Jacob simply because he wasn't the oldest with Rachel and Rachel died when she was given birth to, to Benjamin. Well, his brothers were jealous of him. So you got these other 10 brothers, I'm sorry, 11 brothers. They're jealous of, of Joseph. And you'll remember that they are out tending their flock, their father's flock, and Joseph comes to them and they decide we're going to kill him. They are so jealous of him and his standing in the family. By the way, and Joseph had some pretty incredible dreams himself, making sure that they understood, y'all are going to bow down to me one day. That did not sit well. I can imagine Kendall going to my daughters going, hey, I just want y'all to know, (laughs) not yet, but one day you're going to be bowing down to me. That would not sit well, especially with Kelsey. I'm just going to tell you that. (laughs) But he does that. And we know that instead of being killed, you'll remember he's sold into slavery and he ends up in Egypt. Well, while he's in Egypt, by the way, he interprets dreams because the Lord gives him the interpretation and he becomes second in command to Pharaoh. Well, after Joseph is second in command, again, it's another series of events. Joseph's whole family, his father and all of his brothers, they all end up in Egypt. Well, when they're in Egypt, Jacob or Israel blesses all of his sons. Now, you'll notice that Joseph, when you look at the distribution of the land, and we covered this the other day, but I did have someone email going, that was way too fast. You'll notice in the distribution of the land, there is no land of Joseph. Before Jacob blesses his 12 sons, he pulls Joseph aside and he says, look, your sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, they're like my sons. They're like Reuben and Simeon. So in other words, he elevates his grandsons to son status. And when he does that, Joseph gets no land, but technically his two sons. So he gets double portion through Joseph. The Levites, they have no land because they're distributed and among all the people. And if you want to know why Levi didn't get some land, well, for one thing, they were to minister to everyone. But the other reason is earlier, Levi, dude... That guy's a warrior, and he did some bad things, okay? And so you got to 
keep him under control. It's interesting, it was Levi and Simeon together who did a bad thing. And notice out of all the land, Simeon is surrounded by Judah. You've got to keep this guy under control. So if you want to know more about that, see me after the church and I'll tell you about it. But on a side note, what's interesting, can I just share this with you? You have Reuben, who is the oldest son, and you have Joseph, who is the oldest son by Rachel. And in our thinking and in their thinking, they're the ones who get the highest honor. And yet God sends his son, Jesus Christ, not through either one of them, but through Judah. So if you look at the lineage of Christ, he doesn't go through Reuben and it doesn't go through Joseph. It goes through Judah. But let's keep going. Y'all with me? It's when you're not here. Okay, good. That way I know you're following the history here. Before they go into the promised land, and I have this passage. I'm going to put it up on the screen, and you can read along with me. God says to them in Deuteronomy 20, 15 through 21, See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways and keeping his commandments and statutes and rules, then you shall live and multiply and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away and you will not hear but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have said before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, holding fast to him. And I love this. For he is your life and length of days that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob to give them. So in summary, this is what God is telling the people before they enter the promised land. Keep the commandments, walk in the way of the Lord, and you will live, and all will go well. But if you turn away from God, if you don't listen to me, if if you're drawn away, you will lose the land and die. So he tells them, before they even enter, this is what will happen. So, when you get to Judges, they're in the land, but you'll notice that they did not do it correctly. Just in the first chapter of Judges, you will see Manasseh did not drive out, but did not drive them out completely. And Ephraim did not drive out. Zebulun did not drive out. Asher did not drive out. They did not do what God told them to do. He told them, drive them out. Kill them or drive them out. Get rid of them. Do not allow them to stay in the promised land while you're in the promised land. Don't do it. Wednesday night we were talking about, do you know why? Because he tells them, if you do this, you're going to begin to practice what they practice. So drive them out. Well, they didn't do it. And I I remember when I was preaching on Judges, I said, and I, I still had it here, this is not a list of failed battles. This is a list of failure in obedience. They didn't fail these battles. They just didn't do them. They didn't didn't do what the Lord said. So let me bring this map back up. When you look at the distribution of the land of Israel, and then you go to Judges, and you begin to see where they didn't drive out, Those are approximate places where they did not drive out the people. Now, some of those places don't exist. You've got to go to different maps. So that's the best I could come up with, looking at different maps and approximating where it landed on this map. When you look at these, they did not complete the job there and then put it all the way up to where the kingdom is divided. Notice where most of the people still remained in the northern kingdom. So there's where the most influence of pagan worship, of not listening to God, of ignoring God, stayed was in the northern kingdom. Well, on top of that, if you look at all the kings, you'll notice all of them were bad. All 20 kings, bad. What that means is they had no regard for the Lord, none whatsoever. They didn't follow him. So in 722 B.C., the northern kingdom falls. 
And some of you are going, okay, that's enough history. We're almost there. But you also know that when you get to the southern kingdom, Judah, there are good and bad kings. So there were a lot of bad kings, but there were some good ones too. But eventually it does fall in 586. But I want to zoom in to these, the last ones, because I think this is very interesting. And please, if you tuned out the other history, don't tune this one out. Okay, you ready for this? Because this goes with the second point. You don't want to miss this. When you look at these last seven kings, Jehoiakim, you will recognize that name immediately, correct? Daniel chapter 1. We know that Israel fell during the reign of Jehoiakim. I'm sorry, Judah fell during the reign of Jehoiakim. Well, let's, if you look, you'll notice that out of the seven, there's six bad and there's one good king right there. That's huge. That's so important. So, you look at when Judah was conquered, and you look that there was a good king before that, but I want to go up to his grandfather, Manasseh. And I am glad that the kids are out because I couldn't say some of the things I'm going to say with children in here. His grandfather was so evil that he built altars to false gods. He worshipped the sun, the moon, all the hosts of the heavens, He built altars to those hosts, not just anywhere, but he went into the temple that was for God and he built altars to the sun and the moon and the stars and all that in the very temple that was to be for God. Not only that, he thought, you know what? Let me go ahead and worship the way these other people worship. So he had a son and he burned him alive in order to worship. And by the way, God had already told them, if you don't drive them out, you're going to end up doing the exact same thing. They have gone so far the other direction that they are now killing their children in worship. And you're going, what else? He was into fortune telling. He was into mediums. He was into witchcraft. Here is the king of God's people practicing witchcraft, burning his children. All of this to worship a foreign God, to worship a false God, to worship the sun and the moon and the stars. He's doing all of these things. And he was the king. And I know you're going, yeah, but that's the king. That's not the country. But listen to what Scripture says. Manasseh led them, Judah, astray to do more evil than the nations had done whom the Lord destroyed before the people of Israel. In other words, they are so bad, they make the pagan nations look good. That's how bad they are. So that's who his grandfather is. Then you get to Amon, his son, no better. He continued the same practices that his father had done, and he was killed by his servants. But then there's this guy, Josiah. He began to reign when he was only eight years old. And there's something different about him. The Bible says that what he did was right in the eyes of the Lord. And walked in the way of David, his father. And he did not turn aside to the right or to the left. And he began to undo everything that his grandfather and father had done. He began to tear down the altars to false gods. He, he, began, to, he began to say, man, this is, we're going to follow the Lord. We're going to follow what he says. And what's incredible is that he reigned for 31 years. But 18 years into his reign, it tells us in Scripture that he began to repair the temple. And when he began to repair the temple, he also restored the Passover. And the high priest, Hilkiah, finds the book of the law. All of a sudden, they've got God's Word. And he's so serious about God's Word. Scripture says, About Josiah, before him there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might. Everything that this king was, his heart, his soul, everything that he could command as the king of Judah, he turned to the Lord. And it said, to do according to all the law of Moses, nor did any like him arise after him. As you can see, after him, they were all bad. No one was like Josiah. And so you're going, what's the point? Why would I tell you all of that? Okay, you ready to stay with me here? When you begin to look at the history 
of what's going on here. You'll remember that Daniel was taken as a teenager to Babylon. Please nod your head that you remember that. He's a young, he's a young man. They, we probably believe that he was in his older teen years. Now, when you begin to look at the dates, Josiah begins his reign in 641 B.C. He finds the law, the book of the law, in 623 B.C., and Jerusalem falls three years into the reign of Jehoiakim in 606 B.C. You'll notice there's a 17-year difference there. What I'm suggesting to you is this. It could have been the very year that Daniel was born that the law is recovered and there is revival in Judah. And you're going, yeah, but they, they still fell. Well, the thing about it is, is that Josiah, once he found the book of the law, he basically said, we're in trouble. He said, for great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written. And isn't it amazing that when he comes to this conclusion, and, and it could have been the very year, maybe it was the year after, but it was right there when Daniel was born. Right when he was born, there's this great revival, which is how Daniel begins to, again, just the same way the king led the people to bad, it's now this king who leads them to God's word. It's this king who says, this is what we're going to do. And Daniel is born right when he makes this statement, if you will, for great is the judgment of God. And then Daniel is born, God is my judge. Are you not amazed by this? That God, and, and this is my whole point, is that we may be blindsided, but God is not. God knew that 17 years later, his kingdom's going to fall, but I am getting Daniel ready for what is about to come. He doesn't even know it yet. He's just an infant. Now his name says what I'm going to do, and I am preparing him because he thinks he's going to be blindsided, but I am never blindsided. I know what I'm doing, and I'm preparing him for that. You know, when we get blindsided, usually our reaction is this. This isn't fair. It's not fair that the quarterback, all he was doing was trying to make a pass. He had nothing to do with this guy on the end. And yet he gets blindsided. This isn't fair. What did I do, God, to deserve this? Daniel could have said, what in the world did I do? I was just born. I was living my life for the Lord. I was being taught the things of God. And boom, I lose my home. I lose my culture. I lose my family. I lose my nation. What did I do? And that's the way we all tend to look at things. You realize in that, that's a very loaded question. What did I do to deserve this? In other words, what we're saying is it's it's almost like we have this secular view of God that God is up there, you know what I'm talking about, with lightning bolts ready to strike us down when we do something. Good night. How many of y'all, I know I have seen it many times. You'll say something or do something. Someone's like, oh, let me get away from you. God's going to get you. And we, we tend to adapt that kind of mindset. By the way, that's... Really no different than some of the mindset that was in Scripture. If you're familiar with the book of Job, it's almost a foregone conclusion that Job must have done something to deserve that. In John 9, you know, even Jesus' disciples, see, they see a man who's blind, and what's their question? Who sinned? Was it him? Was it his parents? I mean, who did what to get that? Okay, so let's be clear. Sometimes it is what we do. Sometimes we are being punished or disciplined because of the things that we've done, because of our sin. But people, just like we talked about in 1 Peter, sometimes it's the fallout from just living in a sinful world. And some of, sometimes you and I will feel the effect that sin, of sin even though we didn't contribute to that particular sin. Even though Josiah did all the right things, listen to what God says in 2 Kings. It says, Still the Lord did not turn from the burning of his great wrath, by which his anger was kindled against Judah. 
because of all the provocations which Manasseh had provoked him. And the Lord said, I will remove Judah also out of my sight as I have removed Israel, and I will cast off the city that I have chosen, Jerusalem, and the house of which I said, my name shall be there. Even though Josiah turned his life to the Lord, all of his soul, all of his mind, all of his might was focused on the Lord, Judah's still going to pay the consequences. They're still going to endure the wrath of God because of what his grandfather did. So let me just say, even today, if there's someone in here and you're going, you know what, I'm turning my life around. Man, I'm following God. It doesn't mean that you get to avoid the consequences of your disobedience. You might. He might show grace, but he might say, you know what, you're still going to receive the fallout of this. And you're going, what in the world does that have to do with this story? I think you're about to see, if you didn't see it, there's a second blind side coming. Daniel is now faced with the captain of the guards, and he's told him, I'm here to kill you. And Scripture makes it pretty clear that Daniel's going, for what? I, I don't even know what's going on here. Kill me for... What did the king say? Why did the king... Why is he so... What, what in the world happened? He's completely blindsided. Daniel did not cause the king to have this dream. Daniel was not the cause of him lacking sleep. Daniel was not the cause of his spirit being troubled. Daniel was not the cause of even these other guys going, we can't do this. He, he was not even there. He doesn't even know what's going on. Daniel is not omniscient. He doesn't know. And next thing you know, he's got a captain of the guard going, I got news for you, you're about to die. Order went out, you're dead. God is never surprised. He is never blindsided. I, I mean, think about it. Those of you who are teenagers, what if you went home today? And after you got finished with lunch, your parents said, look, I just got news for you. I know it was raining outside, but you didn't mow the yard. You didn't wash the car and you didn't clean the house. So you're grounded for two weeks. Give me your phone. And you're going, what? I, you didn't even tell me to mow the yard. It was raining all day yesterday. Doesn't matter. That's it. And parents, what if you walked into your job tomorrow and you heard, Keep, pack up your stuff, you're fired. For, for what? You didn't complete the project Friday. You, wait a minute, I had another two weeks on that. You didn't say it was due Friday. Doesn't matter, you're fired. I wanted it done Friday. You didn't do it Friday, you're fired. And you're going, I, I, didn't, even, I didn't even know. Why, why am I fired? Perhaps our problem mine included. We're so busy saying it's not fair. It's not right. That we fail to look back and see that God was preparing us for that all along. Many of you know I, I was devastated four years ago. But isn't it interesting that God afforded me 11 years in seminary before that happened? And just like you, I'm sinful and short-sighted. And of course, my words to God are, this is not fair. I didn't do this. I had no part in this. <clears throat> you know, go back to, to this guy. Do you think that the trainers and the coaches waited for him to get hit like that? And then, he said, and then they said, oh, you know what? Maybe we should put some pads on you. Now that your back is all jacked up, maybe we should put some pads on you. They knew that that was going to happen. There's not a quarterback out there who could say, I've never been hit. They knew it was going to happen. So even though it looks like he's got on some shoulder pads and some pads on his knees, trust me, he is padded. He, he's got like a bulletproof vest on him. Because those coaches and trainers know this guy's going to get blindsided. So we're going to take care of him beforehand, before he ever goes out on the field. Let me tell you something. If coaches and trainers know that, don't you believe that God knows that? That God knows when we're going to get blindsided? 
I would suggest to you, based upon what we will cover next week, that Daniel looked at this situation and he knew that God was not surprised. He knew the situation was out of his hand, but he, he turned to the Lord. In Psalm 147, we're told, Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. I want to put this one up for you from Isaiah. Remember this. Look right here. This is said to us. Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient things to things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. So I'll preach it to you. And then when you see me weak, and I'm going, it's not fair. Why did this happen to me? You preach it to me and say, you remember this, Paul. You preach that. Stand firm. God's got this. God knows it all, and his purpose will be accomplished. You remember this, Pastor. Because there will be days when you'll need to remind me, and I would venture to say there will be days when I need to remind you. Stand firm. God's got all of this beginning to the end. Daniel is about to lose his life. And he turns to the Lord because he knows the Lord has this. This morning, as we come to an invitation, and I realize that was a lot of information. God prepared Daniel for when he would lose his home, brought about a revival to get him ready. He prepared him for when he was going to be blindsided. And you're going to see he prepared Daniel for other trials and tribulations in his life. Just know wherever you are, and you may be going, I didn't, I've said this over and over the last several years. This is not what I planned for my life. This is not what I planned. Good night. I was supposed to be an architect doing other things, and yet here I am, a divorced pastor. This is not, this was never, when I was in high school, and I said, what do you have plans for your life? You know what? I'm thinking I'll be divorced in about 20 years, and, and then I'll go into the ministry. I, and that was never the plan. And yet God's going, let me tell you something. I'm going to accomplish my purpose. This isn't about your purpose, Paul. This is about my purpose. And I'm going to accomplish it. No matter what, I'm going to see this through. So maybe you're sitting here and you're going, this is not my plan. I am not in my life where I thought I would be at 18, at 28, at 38, at 48, at 68. This is not what I thought. But I'm telling you, stand firm. The Lord has already ordained it from beginning to end. And maybe this morning you just need to come and you don't even need me. You just need to come and bow and say, you know what? I'm sorry for not trusting you. Maybe this morning is just a chance for you to reflect. Oh my gosh, he has been getting me ready for this. Maybe this morning the Lord is saying, you know what? Your spirit is troubled because you don't know the Prince of Peace. You don't know Christ. You don't know peace because you don't know me. And maybe the Lord is saying, come, come to me this morning. It doesn't mean that you won't have troubles in this world. Again, it could just be fallout from sin we had no no part in. But oh man, even if the troubles take your very life, you can be at peace because I'm with you now, and when this life ends, you'll be with me. So what is the Lord telling you to do this morning? How will you respond? Why go home again tonight going, I can't sleep. I'm still troubled. When peace is waiting for you. So I'm going to lead in prayer. And he's going to come and lead us in song. 
But the point of the invitation is for you to respond to the invite of God. What is he inviting you to do? Why not respond to him this morning? Let's pray.